Good morning, good evening, good good to whoever needs it. This might not sync with the video. Please be patient with me while I'm figuring this out. Good morning, good evening, good good to who needs it. Um, so you want to hear like a real gothy witch bitch problem? Good morning, good evening, good good to who needs it. This is a pick a card reading for a yes or no question, and I'm doing it kind of in an unusual way. So I ran into a non-humbling snag when I was trying to make a video explaining how cold reads are done. I'm good at them. I had people, despite voiceovers about how I was doing what I was doing, why I was doing what I was doing, commenting in questions and giving me very personal information, handing that information over to a stranger on the internet. Maybe that itself is the cathartic release that they had needed, just to be heard by someone, but it's a strange position to put myself in as someone who repeatedly was saying, this is just storytelling, using cards as prompts, it's not mystical, it's not spirit, and it's not about you. The human ability to relate to things outside of ourselves is thought to stem from the evolutionary trait that we don't have a way of determining our babies from one another. We can't sniff a baby and say, oh yeah, that's Joe's. We had to evolve to care about things outside of ourselves for the sake of the species. Babies are cute for the sake of the species. We adopt children, we adopt pets, because our love for something is not limited by it being us. And in a roundabout way, this is why metaphor works. We can see two incongruent things and make connections anyway. It's arguably our best and worst trait as a species because we make some really interesting connections. I began writing Sagittarius shortly after a friend of mine had died and a glut of people in our friend group began turning to and believing in a variety of mysticisms to cope with this. Initially, I thought it would be a fun exercise in writing. Instead of plotting out a book like a normal insane person, I'd read his horoscope each morning and use that as a prompt. It's a cool gimmick. Don't recommend it. It sucked. But in that process, I learned a lot of divination techniques. A lot of things about mysticism and magical tourism. I went to psychic fairs. I interviewed spiritual leaders in their communities. I took a way harder deep dive into this than probably anyone realizes. Maybe that was my own way of coping. But for the purposes of this video, I learned how to do a cold read. You can argue that there's a spiritual element and intuition to why you're drawn to a particular story that you're being told, or you can turn to psychology. The choice is yours. I'm honestly not making this video to dunk on spiritualist communities, some of which have been extremely, incredibly kind to me and put up with my questioning and interviewing, and I have met some extremely interesting, amazing people in the process, and I wouldn't want to say anything to disrespect them. This is less about taking tarot or mysticism apart, and more about how to tell a story. I'm going to make a video on the darker side of all of this, the magical tourism, later, but for right now, this is about storytelling. Um, so you want to hear like a real gothy witch bitch problem? I decided I was going to do a pick a card today and show you guys kind of how to do a cold read that way. And, uh, so I've seen a lot of pick a cards. You may have seen them as well on internet.com somewhere that have the option of picking a crystal and that crystal is going to be associated with the deck of cards. And that's supposed to be the energy that's imbued on there. And um, my witch bitch problem is that I couldn't find my really big gypsum rose this morning. And that's really troubling for me as a nerd. I have three decks for you to choose from and I will put the timestamps below. You can choose number one, this mysterious deck of cards that I don't know where it came from. I just have had it for a really long time. and. It is going to be paired with this very cool geode. Next, we are going to have the Art Nouveau deck. This one is really, really gorgeous. If you're vibing with it, go for it. And on that one, I put this little quartz point. Again, I have bigger quartz points somewhere, but where, who knows? As a weird person who collects cards and, and rocks, you'd think I would keep track of that sort of thing. And then over here, we're going to be using the Tarot del Toro. So this is an absolutely gorgeous woodcut deck with a lot of horror themes based on Guillermo del Toro's work. Here is, yep, here is the name of the artist. Hopefully that comes in focus. Fantastic. And I'll show you the Art Nouveau again when I pick it up so that we can get into uh, who that artist is as well. And on that, I have two pieces of pyrite. This is a pretty standard setup for an online tarot reading, like what you find all over YouTube. 
You're normally encouraged to redirect or focus your energy onto which deck calls to you, either aesthetically or because it reminds you of the subject that you're talking about. The connection is what is meant to give you the weight and significance to why a particular deck will be the one to have your answers. Typically, also, you're encouraged to listen to the other stories, the other decks, if the one you picked initially doesn't work out for you or doesn't resonate. The Major Arcana follow the story of the Fool through a quintessential hero's journey, so, of course, that means Carl Jung. The type of painting exercise I'm doing in the background, by the way, is called neurographic art, and I chose it on purpose. Neurographic art is a way of drawing that is thought to be about the subconscious. People are encouraged to spend some time thinking about a problem which they are facing, and then to make shapes typically beginning off of the page, and bring them into focus, creating new connections while doodling the problem out in abstract forms, no hard edges. I can't speak to if it solves anything, but it is a pretty comic exercise, and it ties in nicely to my buddy Carl. Buddy, I, I don't know. Carl and I have a dubious relationship, I guess. Arguably, Jung's most significant contribution to psychology is the concept of individuation, the process of differentiation between internal and external parts of the self. This lives on pretty fiercely in internal family systems therapy today. In every fantasy, a grain of truth, hence the connections we are able to make to stories. Jung asserted that most of the self are stories which we tell ourselves from different perspectives, and those perspectives clashing results in interpersonal struggles. We are influenced by microsystems, mesosystems, exosystems, macrosystems, and chronosystems. IFS, and any practitioner who has worked in IFS can attest, you do eventually find the self buried in all of the different realms of influence. At the end of the day, there is a you, but it can be tucked in there pretty fucking tight. Jung pursued the idea of archetypes, which has its pros and cons. Jung had been mentored by Freud, and Freud kind of put all of his eggs into that basket, thinking Jung would be the future of psychoanalysis. And importantly, Jung was a Christian, which meant less friction for him in the scientific societies that Freud had faced as a Jew. However, Jung broke away from the theories of psychosexual development and focused instead on the unconscious, and he also made some anti-Semitic remarks that got him turned away from these psychoanalysts. Jung saw himself as slighted by them for his dissenting opinions and went on to form independent theories. Jung saw Freud's view of the unconscious as incomplete and wholly negative. Personal unconscious and collective unconscious were terms coined by Jung referring to the integration of archetypes into the sphere of influence on the self. Archetypes, or primordial images, were stock concepts that Jung believed belonged in the collective unconscious. Basically, these are universal concepts that anyone can relate to, but Jung took it a step further from concepts into defined stock characters, concerns, and stereotyping. The existence of the collective unconsciousness, in his theory, means that individual consciousness is not a blank slate, but is influenced by predetermination. This is where a lot of pseudoscience creeps in. None of this can be empirically examined, and sounds more like philosophy than psychology. That was the nature of 18th century psychology in its beginnings when they weren't sure how to study it. And a lot of people have taken hold of these concepts and run in just about every direction with them. One direction being Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Uh, as always, I am not a tarot reader. I'm doing this for fun. This is for entertainment purposes only and hopefully education purposes to show you how a cold read is done and how easy it is to do. So let's see what story I'm telling you today. If you wanted a yes and therefore chose the Darrow del Toro, we're doing a divination style card spread and I've pulled out eight of swords, four of swords, queen of cups reversed. Whoa. <laughs> uh, I don't think you're going to get your yes. The monomyth is a common template for stories involving a hero setting out on an adventure who is successful in a quest and comes home after undergoing a fundamental change. One which means that the hero never truly returns home because while home is unchanged, the hero has undergone a metamorphosis born out of a decisive crisis. This hero myth pattern was popularized by Joseph Campbell in his work Hero with a Thousand Faces, heavily influenced by Carl Jung, though similar concepts had been pointed out by anthropologists and even psychoanalysts beforehand. The concept of the monomyth is one that gets a lot of heat from folklorists because it relies heavily on confirmation bias. 
essentially arguing that people who want there to be archetypes in stories go looking for them and just ignore the things which don't fit their desired pattern. Most people today take Hero with a Thousand Faces for fact rather than an option, and it's always really delightful when you're in a writing workshop and you see someone light up when they realize that they don't have to do that. The turn monomyth was actually lifted from James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, and this concept is better known popularly as the Hero's Journey. The hero's journey is relevant to our purposes, as is all this background information I've given, because the major arcana in the tarot deck each represent a segment of this proposed journey, and the storytelling elements of how tarot cards are read fall into the same narrative arc as the monomyth. The story told in the major arcana begins with the fool, the starting point, which is why he is the zero card. The fool represents a person starting out on the journey, the person who is an innocent and is just biding their time, not yet embroiled in the conflict of the story. The first card is the magician. This is a person balancing as above, so below. Their whole idea is that they are pointing both up and down. They have the tools in front of them. So this sometimes is taken to represent the fool being given the tools in order to begin this journey, or sometimes it's interpreted as the divine masculine, the ability to take charge and begin the journey. This is combined with the fact that the th third card is the high priestess. This represents the divine feminine. These are two aspects of the fool, the, the high priestess and the magician. Conversely, the two cards that follow, the empress and the emperor, are considered the parents of the fool. They are the foundation. The next card after the emperor and empress is the hierophant, or sometimes the pope. This is meant to represent the need to gain more knowledge. You have set out on your journey, you have tools, you have blessing, you have foundation, but now you need to actually learn. That's probably the most key part of the story is is how you learn. The next card is the lovers, which is not only about attraction and beauty, but it's also about distraction. This is something coming in. This is your alliances as the fool. In some decks, the lovers are meant to represent Adam and Eve. So this is also a point of conflict. This is where that knowledge that you gained as the Hierophant or from the Hierophant is now causing an awakening. The card following the lovers is the chariot. This represents taking that information, taking that awakening, and choosing your direction, your path forward, now that you have this new goal or this new perspective. The card that follows this is justice. This is not only choosing a path, but making a decisive action about it. It is standing in judgment. This has both positive and negative connotations and leads into the hermit. You have gone through so many transformations already that have been kind of earth shattering. You have gained new knowledge, you have gained new understanding of self, you have gained an awakening and you have taken actions, but now it's time to kind of slow down, hunker down and really focus on yourself. You are the hermit. You are the hermit becoming the hierophant. The tenth trump card in the Major Arcana is the Wheel of Fortune. This is about coming into your destiny. This is about accepting forces outside of your control, which before you entered your hermit phase, you really weren't going to be able to do because you were so focused on your knowledge and the tools that you had been given. You didn't really let things take their course. Obviously, letting things take their course takes a great deal of strength and wisdom, which is, leads into the Hanged Man. The hangman is about personal sacrifice and also about frugality and wisdom. The person hanging is taking the time, the passivity, to be able to leave things still. It involves a certain disinterest in worldly things and instead a focus on how to let nature take its course. The hangman leads in, of course, to death. Death is the most 
transformative card of the tarot. And it is not necessarily a negative card to receive. It actually can be a really wonderful card to receive because it represents that a major change has occurred, whether by your wishes or volition or not. But we are now in a place after. We are in a place of metamorphosis. And living and sitting with that metamorphosis is going to take a great deal of temperance. But uh-oh. Don't forget that this is a three-act play. We're now at the end of Act 2. So we've undergone our major metamorphosis, but now we're facing the devil. We're facing the threat that we didn't realize was the threat. The devil leads into the tower. The tower is, for many people, the worst card to receive in the deck. It represents a major transformation for the negative. It is catastrophe. It is a chaos moment. We are now at the beginning of Act 3. Following the tower immediately is the star, and the star is often considered by many people one of their favorite cards of the deck because it represents overcoming, followed by the moon. Moon is often secrets. It's what you aren't quite sure of yet. Remember, we're still in the third act. We're not at the end yet. But once we get through those secrets, we enter into the sun. We now have true awakening. We now have true judgment. And once we're able to judge things for what they truly are with no secrets and through our own transformation, we enter the world. So the person who first popularized this Jungian view of the tarot was Sally Nichols. Nichols wrote about these connections back in 1980 in her book Jung and the Tarot, An Archetypical Journey. And this is a pretty common interpretation I've seen these days, and there's even young themed tarot decks floating around for sale. There's an edition of Nichols' book available on Internet Archive. As noted in the foreword of that 2019 edition by uh, Mary Kay Greer, Jung was aware of the tarot and also entirely wrong and dismissive of it. So these connections really went under the radar and were popularized only after Joseph Campbell's work Hero with a Thousand Faces was in its second edition. Campbell's popularity exploded with a six-episode documentary series, Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth, which ran in June 1988. People lashed hard onto the teachings of comparative mythology which he employed, and in many instances treated Campbell's philosophy as a spiritual awakening. Between that and the growing amount of Jungian psychology being used to explain the power of tarot, the interpretation of divination and storytelling became fused. Look at him. Look at how happy he looks. This is Anton Kor, who is believed to have initiated the interpretation of tarot as esoteric in 1781. It was his interpretation upon the first time he saw a tarot deck, allegedly, that he immediately believed it to hold the mysteries of ancient Egypt. is a very specific form of cultural appropriation that involves an esoteric interpretation. Funny enough, there are examples of Egyptomania occurring in contemporary settings where ancient Egyptians could have looked around and said, hey, that's not what, that's not what we do. Egyptomania refers to a blend of appropriate uses of motifs and bizarre interpretations made by people who are doing the appropriation of ancient Egyptian cultures. Do we like it, Tom? So Egyptomania is often esoteric in nature. It's often assuming a cultural standpoint that the Egyptians had some sort of secret knowledge and that's why they stand out in the ancient world from other cultures so much. One of the earliest examples of Egyptomania that I'm personally aware of uh, was Emperor Hadrian having an obelisk commissioned. Antinous, also called Antinous, was a Greek youth and a favorite and lover of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. It's unclear necessarily how he died, but on their journey up the Nile, they were stopped at Hermopolis, the primary shrine to the god Thoth, it was shortly before this, around the time of the festival of Osiris, that he fell into the river and died probably from drowning. 
Hadrian was devastated. In Egypt, the local priesthood immediately deified him, identifying him with Osiris due to the manner of his death having fallen into the Nile. He was embalmed and mummified. He died very young, right before his 20th birthday, and on Hadrian's order, he was deified, being worshipped both in the Greek East and Latin West, sometimes as a god, though other times as just a hero. This caused an enormous stir in Rome, where a wave of Egyptomania took place. It became extremely, extremely popular. Uh, Hadrian's decision to declare Antinous a god and create a formal cult devoted him was extremely unusual, and he did so without the permission of the Senate. It is through Hadrian's deification of Antinous that we begin to associate esoteric astrological symbols common in Rome with Egyptian mythological symbols. And Foncourt wrote, The primeval world analyzed and compared to the modern world, to which there were many subscribers in the French court, including Louis XVI or Louis the Last. In Volume 8, 1781 of Antoine Cour's work, he included an essay on tarot in which he proclaimed with no historical evidence that Egyptian priests had condensed the Book of Thoth into images of the tarot, that this was known by the Romans and a secret knowledge held by popes, and pushed through into Avignon in the 14th century with an appendix detailing how to use the cards in cardomancy. There's also a splash of anti-Semitism in there with some Kabbalah that we won't get into. It's this guy. This guy made it all up. Within two years, French occultist Jean-Baptiste Dallet had published instructional guides on cardamancy using the tarot in which he incorporated the four elements, humors, and astrology. So what did I learn from all of this, except for reinforcing European history's hard-on for turning ancient Egypt into the occult? Is it diminished by the fact some French guys pulled it out of their ass? It's important to remember, Young and Campbell didn't talk about tarot. Young thought of it as something Spanish G-slurs came up with. Campbell was more interested in stories that already were, not making new ones with a card trick. The idea of archetypes and storytelling, comparative mythology, and common themes and cycles exists independent of tarot's history. And it wasn't until the 1980s that I was even able to find any sources connecting the two. Just because the story, the esoteric history of tarot might be completely fabricated, it doesn't mean that the human brain isn't wired to relate to stories. Tarot resonates with us because stories do. The cards help you to tell a story. Fuck it. Use the cards. For more information on this topic, sources, and other content, please look at the associated blog post on aliactus.com. That's A-L-I-A-C-T-A-S-T dot com. The blog updates with weekly book reviews and essays on Saturdays. If you liked this, like it and share whatever you feel you gotta do. There are monthly video essays the last week of every month and a plethora of random shit in between. Thank you so much for listening.